Hello and welcome to a collaborative industry webinar series focusing on tomato potato psyllid with a short update on fall armyworm and vegetable leaf miner. This series contains five separate 15 minute presentations delivered by industry specialists aimed at informing and upskilling producers and service industry providers on key research and topics associated with these pests. These pests can cause significant economic damage to a large range of horticultural crops and their management is essential in assuring sustainability of the industry. Please feel free to send through any questions that you may have to the email address supplied at the end of each presentation. Please sit back, relax and enjoy the presentations. Maddie Quirk is a Biosecurity Officer with Ausveg and will provide information on the key findings of the Vegetable Leaf Miner Project and a quick fall armyworm update. Today I'll be talking about a little bit about fall armyworm um, and then giving a bit of an update on a hoard innovation funded project that I'm working on um, for Vegetable Leaf Miner. So, Fall armyworm um, is an invasive insect pest that feeds on a number of host plants, um, more than 350 recorded host crops. Um, it's native to the tropical and subtropical regions of the Americas and has since um, been found in Africa, uh, India, China and Southeast Asia. However, in um, early 2020, it was first detected um, on, in the Torres Strait Islands um, and then made its way throughout Queensland, um, followed by detections in Northern Territory and in Western Australia, including Kununurra, Broome and Carnarvon. Um, the government has deemed that it's not technically feasible to eradicate this pest from Australia. A little bit about the life cycle of a fall armyworm. There are four stages, egg, larva, pupa and adult. Um, I've got some images here on the left hand side of the screen. Um, but some distinctive features are that the eggs are laid in masses of about 100 to 200 on the other side of the leaf. Um, a larva um, is typically light green to brown, but um, is not distinguished by its colour um, so much as by some of the other pa um, patterns that you can see on its body. So um, in particular, the inverted Y pattern on the head, but this is um, common to a lot of other army worms, so um, you need to also look out for four dark grey spots on, at the end of the abdomen, um, shaped in a square. Um, in terms of the pupae, they, uh, pupation occurs in the soil but sometimes in um, the leaf litter and adults are moths and their wingspan ranges from 32 to 40 um, millimetres um, and they can fly long distances and migrate quickly. So that um, really unfortunately assists with their um, easy spread. This YouTube link on the bottom here um, just links to a video of the life cycle of a fall armyworm on maize. It's quite an interesting um, depiction of how the life cycle works. In terms of the fall armyworm hosts, uh, as I mentioned there are a number of host crops but it does seem to prefer, um, well it does attack maize, sweet corn, um, sorghum, rice and grass crops as well as a number of vegetable crops um, listed here. Some of the symptoms that you could, you will see on sweet corn and other vegetables include um, leaf damage such as windowing, um, tattered leaf margins, skeletization, defoliation and chewing. Um, you can also um, identify a fall armyworm um, from its frass or the waste that it leaves behind and it's important to check deep into the plant stem um, for larvae as well. Uh, if you suspect fall armyworm what do you do? Well we know that early detection is critical um, for the effective control of fall armyworm in vegetable crops as with other, as with other um, pests such as tomato potato psyllid that we'll talk, we've been talking about today. Um, regularly checking your crops is important but also importing, uh, reporting to the exotic plant pest hotline. Um, in addition to that, a number of chemicals have been registered for fall armyworm and um, they're available from the APVMA. So if you need more information on pest management advice, um, please contact your relevant State Department of um, Primary Industries. Now moving on to um, a little bit on exotic leaf miners. Um, exotic leaf miners are polyphagous pests that eat a number of different hosts. Um, they are significant pests overseas and pose a, a threat to Australia's horticulture industry as well. 
So some of the key pests that I'll focus on um, today are Liriomyza weedabrensis, which is potato leaf miner, um, American serpentine leaf miner, which is um, Liriomyza trifoliae, and Liriomyza sativi, which is the vegetable leaf miner. Um, potato leaf miner and American serpentine leaf miner are not present in Australia, but both are found in Indonesia. However, a uh, vegetable leaf miner was found, was detected in the Torres Strait Islands in 2008 and found, made its way to the mainland um, in 2015 and is currently present in Seychelles, which is at the very tip of uh, Cape York Peninsula. And we want to ensure that it doesn't spread to the rest of Australia. They're very small. You can see um, a picture of a vegetable leaf miner next to a five cent piece there, one to two millimetres in length. So in terms of the life cycle, um, it's very, it can be very short, as short as three weeks long. Um, it consists of an egg, larva, pupa and adult stage. So in the larval stage, you can, I've actually put a little gif here and where you can see a larva inside um, a leaf between the top and bottom layer of the leaf. It's um, eating away at the plant material and you can see it's kind of hacking um, its mouth part there as well so as it moves through the plant. Um, so this is the key characteristic damage that leaf miners um, create, which is those spiraling leaf mines. And you can also see it in that image on the right hand side there. But on top of that characteristic damage, there's also other damage, which is known as stippling. So this is when the adult female feeds and lays her eggs. You can see that they're those little white dots um, within that right hand photo there. Um, exotic leaf miners, as I mentioned, they're polyphagous, so they feed on a number of different hosts, um, including a number of vegetables, so chili, capsicum, um, pumpkin, tomato, um, and the list goes on. But on top of that, they also feed on cut flowers and ornamental plants um, and many weed hosts. So up in the incursion front, um, they're seeing leaf miner feeding on, vegetable leaf miner feeding on um, sriracha weed, which is really common in that region. So at the plant level, there are a number of impacts that can be seen, such as um, a disruption in photosynthesis caused by the leaf mining. And then the stippling, which I mentioned before, um, can actually cause secondary infection to the plant as well. Um, if excessive mining occurs, this can stunt the growth of the plant and cause fruit failure or fruit to drop um, or kill the plant entirely, particularly in young plants um, when they're just first um, in their first stages of growth. At the business level, a number of impacts can be seen as well as a result of leaf miners. Um, these include farm quarantine and um, a potential reduction in yield to the crop, but also a loss of marketability, particularly to those plants that are sold with their uh, leaves intact. Um, overseas, pest management has been really costly um, as a result of resistance to a number of chemicals, so this could be a potential impact as well. Just in terms of some real world examples, Liriomyza trifoliae, which is American serpentine leaf miner, cost um, the Californian greenhouse industry 21 uh, in the USA, um, $21 million per year when it first hit. Um, similarly, potato leaf miner caused a massive yield loss of 70% in potatoes when it first came into Indonesia. Um, but I guess first we really want to understand why such high yield losses are occurring overseas. So, um, this is a great example here that explains that. Um, we're looking at two different um, bean plants here and one of them has been significantly mined and the other one has not. You might think the one on the right um, doesn't have any chemicals being sprayed but it's actually the plant that has a lot of the chemicals being sprayed and the reason this is happening is because in its natural environment the uh, vegetable leaf mine is held in check largely by parasitoid wasps, which are their beneficial insects that attack um, the leaf miner species. Um, if the chemicals are used and they're, um, they're knocking out the parasitoid wasps while also knocking out the adult leaf miners, but then of course there are those uh, leaf miners that are still larvae inside the leaf and then they come out, pupate in the soil and then um, become adults and there are no beneficial insects um, the environment anymore due to the chemicals wiping them all out. So as a result of that polyphagous leaf miners really are secondary pests where um, they're not really so much of a problem until something changes in the environment such as a chemical being sprayed um, causing a secondary outbreak. And we're seeing this 
uh, chemical mismanagement happening a lot of the time overseas um, in various examples, leading to uh, insecticide resistance as well. Um, so a little bit about the project that we're working on. It's a hot innovation funded project through the vegetable uh, nursery melons and potato levies. It started in 2017 and is finishing up in November this year um, and is led by CESAR with uh, partners partnering with University of Melbourne, Plant Health Australia, Northern Australia Quarantine Strategy and Ausveg. Um, we're also, we varied the project last year so that we could cover um, those other exotic leaf miners, which is why I've mentioned a little bit about all three so far. Um, so a few areas of the project I'd like to touch on. Um, the first is estimating risk of leaf miner in Western Australia. So um, the models that our project has created have been based on the population of vegetable leaf miner um, biology and what we know about how, what temperature it's killed at and what temperature it thrives at and take this into consideration with um, Australia's climate. So then this produce, we've produced a map of um, the risk of establishment of leaf miner in different regions across Australia. Um, zooming in on WA, you can see that this risk really varies depending on where you are. Um, the red, dark red indicates little to no risk of leaf miner um, and green is high risk. So, if we zoom in on different regions across Western Australia, we have Perth um, on the left, Geraldton in the middle, and Carnarvon on the right. Um, and you can really see that there's some differences here. So um, if we're looking at the risk in Perth, we can see that the, the risk of leaf miner establishment um, is predicted to be quite low in, the, in that summer and winter period, but potentially could be moderate to high in um, the spring and autumn periods. Um, Although in Geraldton it's about half half throughout the year and in Carnarvon it's low, um, it's predicted to be low risk of establishment uh, throughout the entire year. Although keeping in mind if we compare this to a region that's considered very high risk for vegetable leaf miner, which is Bundaberg in Queensland, we can see that there's some really dark green occurring in that um, summer period, whereas it's only moderate green in the, um, some of the examples from Western Australia. So therefore, the overall risk in these regions, I would say for Perth, um, the predictions are moderate, predictions in Geraldton are moderate as well, and then a low predicted risk of establishment in Carnarvon. You can explore this tool that we've developed, it's online um, in an interactive portal at this site here as well. Um, in addition to um, these models, we've actually developed some surveillance guidelines for vegetable leaf miner surveillance. So, um, we've determined that visual surveillance is going to be more um, uh, less difficult uh, by detecting from the mined leaves rather than trying to detect the pest itself, just due to the small, um, how small the pest is and how hard it is to spot. Uh, of course, early reporting of unusual symptoms is critical, so looking for those leaf mines um, and taking a sample and putting it away, putting it in the fridge in the bag and calling the exotic plant pest hotline. Um, we've also developed some DNA tests that look at um, the DNA left over in an empty leaf uh, from the leaf miner. So this is allowing us to use the DNA left over in that leaf rather than having to find those pests themselves and um, we're progressing with those tests um, at the moment. So as I mentioned, we've developed a surveillance guide and it's available from the Ausveg website. Um, the details more information on how to survey your, uh, your crops for leaf miners. Now, um, I also want to mention a little bit about one of the key findings from the project, which um, is biological control. So we've found that biological control is going to form an integral part of a, um, an integrated pest management program for leaf miner control. Um, in the incursion front, up in the Torres Strait and in Seisha, uh, our research has shown that there are more than six species that are already controlling those leaf miner levels up there. So unassisted field mortality rates of vegetable leaf miner have been shown to reach as high as 80% in the natural environment up um, in those incursion fronts, which is incredibly high. And in addition to that, Australia also has um, more than 50 wasps 
species that could potentially control exotic leaf miners. So these not only include the species um, that we can, we've already found up in the incursion front, but also species that are well known um, for strong leaf miner management over cities. And some of those uh, examples are listed below. In addition, um, we do know that we that chemical control is also an option, but it should be part of an integrated approach. So utilising those biological control through parasitoid wasps that exist in Australia, um, and also just considering which pesticides we're spraying and when. So um, we need to minimise the disruption to parasitoid populations um, because of that example that I mentioned before, when they're wiped out, leaf miner becomes a secondary pest issue. So some of the effective insecticides are systemic and translamina. Uh, we've, we've found that there's been resistance, as I've mentioned throughout this talk, to insecticides overseas, and some of those include the SPs, OPs, um, spinosad and avamectin. And in addition to that, um, Plant Health Australia has submitted a number of permits um, to the APVMA, and these are listed here, so in order to prepare industry for leaf mining. Um, you can find out more information on chemical and biological control at Ausveg's website as well, or by emailing um, me following this talk. And finally, to summarise, um, the, leaf, the exotic leaf miners, um, they affect a number of crops from a variety of families and have the potential for high levels of damage um, if they are mismanaged. Uh, the vegetable leaf miner is currently found in Torres Strait and in Seisha on the Cape York Peninsula, but the other two leaf miners are not found in Australia. Exotic leaf miners are more likely to be detected by the damage rather than the pests themselves. So early detection of unusual symptoms is crucial. And parasitoid wasps will play a significant role in leaf miner control in Australia. So I'd just like to thank these groups here um, for the work that they've been doing as part of the project.